Thank you. So my position in this space is a little bit different than some of the other speakers. I work more on the actual strategy of the impact side, but interestingly, if you think back to Brett's slide a few ago where he went from kind of pure cause to pure profit, I would say that we are doing the majority of our work right now on the pure profit side, purely because that's where it's more of a differentiator and more of a unique area of work. So while some of this might sound a little more on the nonprofit side of the world, vis-a-vis -vis where some of you are at right now, um, it really is something to be thinking at at every step along the way and how to, to Brett's point, do it well. My clients do range from corporations to individuals, some of whom are high profile, to foundations and nonprofits. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do across a host of topics, some of which you see at the bottom, is to help people figure out what their best and highest use of energy is in the space they care about. For some of them, they don't yet know which space they care about, and that's more just on the corporate side. How can we make a difference in the world in a way that resonates with our investors, our customers, our employees? Um, but we help people figure out how to do it well, figure out who to work with, and then in many cases actually help them do it. This is sort of the laundry list of what we do across that continuum. So if you look on the left, this is more for companies that are just starting, for individuals who are just looking to get into the cause space who say either again, what do I want to work on? Or if I know what I want to work on, but I don't know how to do it, help me figure out how to do that. So this is everything from the 101, how are you going to talk about what you do and why you care? And also going back to Brett's point about if your initial pitch isn't resonating, we help on that. Because sometimes things are super clear in your head on the cause side, but that doesn't mean that to people who don't do this every day, it's as clear. So helping people figure out how to articulate that mission and where they live in the space is something that's core to our work. Helping them design their programs, whether they're going to do them or partner with other organizations, and then figuring out what the actual strategies are on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis to implement and track their work. In the middle, this is a little this is a little more in the nonprofit space. Although sometimes for corporations who are new to this, there is also that question of how does it separate from our for-profit work? Or again, if it's not connected to a for-profit, what do we need to do to do it well and to not get into trouble? Because the nonprofit space and the B Corp space, it's actually not as complicated as people think, but there are some sand traps. So you do have to know what you're doing. And sometimes the headlines you'll see, whether they're typically celebrities, but often corporations where they've made errors, is where people thought they could approach um, cause work like they approach their for-profit work and aren't um, on top of some of the nuances. And then on the far side, this is for some of our clients who we actually then end up running their effort from day to day. Some of the corporations are startup. They're like, we love it. We know our employees care, but we don't have a single other body to put in it. So we need you guys to be the, the project manager on this. And then for others, they just say, we'd rather you do it um, so we don't start yet another foundation that's sort of a you know redheaded stepchild, if you will, of the organization that no one works with. So this is a little bit, this is taking a step back to more of a 30,000 foot um, level. You know, the word philanthropy in and of itself is one that conjures up very different meanings for different people. And a lot of times the meanings are still a little bit outdated. It's still, you know, the titans of business make all their money and at the end of life kind of give some of it away. I'm sure obviously everyone in this room is aware of how that has changed at differing levels. But some of the key pieces we see, again, for organizations who used to do it, it used to be more of a, hey, we're highly profitable, we're a consumer product company or whatnot, and now we're going to have a foundation that gives money away. Maybe in areas that make some sense to the core of what this organization exists to do, but more often than not, no. That is changing. Not only are uh, cause-related efforts more integrated now into the core of the business, um, but they do need to tie to and support the corporation's actual goals or the early stage organization's goals. There used to be a few philanthropic leaders. Now everyone is in the business, whether they want to or not. Again, it used to be later. Now it's expected from the outset. There used to be more of a focus on ratio and metrics and things that really most of the people who talked about them didn't even completely understand them. Now the focus is more on what are you doing? I mean, what at the end of the day has been made better in the world as a result of what you're doing, not what percentage of whatever went to whatever. Similarly, you know, we used to talk about how much you gave. Now it's how much you got out at the end of the work. And then finally, um, there's just a greater level of engagement. And I think for 
your organizations, this is especially relevant because a lot of people will say to us, you know, I'm early, my God, I'm trying to get the money to get the organization running. I don't have time yet to think about giving it away, which is quite often true. But often you can make an outsized, if not greater, impact on social issues in non-financial ways. So we have organizations who, whether it is through employee engagement or product or whatever the case, or even, you know, loaning their assets out at night. I mean, we have one major high-end retailer who used her Organi or her um, retail locations when the stores were closed at night to bring people in for other kinds of training and other activities. So I think that's um, important to keep in mind. So this, this is kind of more getting back to my point of if you were a hostile audience and were like, why should I do this? Why does it matter? You know, which they're, they're still out there, you know. In fairness, I got these questions and comments more a number of years ago. I mean, I still, I always, one of our patented case studies was a bajillion years ago um, when we did a lot of Bono's early Africa work. People saying, when we did the Gap Product Red um, campaign, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Yeah, people may want to put something on them that looks good, but how does that actually matter, make money, et cetera? Now, and I feel like we knew that this evolution would happen However, it happened faster than I would have expected at that time. Now it's more of just a given. Again, let's pretend you're that caricature of a person who actually doesn't care. You have to care now because your employees, your customers, your stakeholders, your investors do. So these are just a few cherry-picked metrics, which I'm sure you can, can read on your own, but it's just saying you know it, it matters. And if you don't care, your business is still going to do better if you engage in these issues. So this is a quick, again, I have like, it, to, to Brett's point, if you want like the deck of all this data and you can cherry pick it, please feel free to contact me afterwards. We have that and we keep it updated. These are a few consumer facing metrics. You know, we've got almost 90% of customers saying they switch brands because of social engagement. Same numbers saying they're more loyal to companies that are cause related. And then about a 79% of those polled saying that they expect their businesses to keep doing these efforts or they're not going to patronize them anymore. Millennials in particular, not surprisingly, everyone likes to laugh at millennials. They're so far ahead on these metrics. And actually, and this is the data that's very exciting to me that's finally coming out, not only do they say these things in reports and studies, but they actually walk the talk when it comes to buying decisions. So we all know the power they have in terms of spending, that they're likely to switch brands, but they're very likely to punish brands if you make a mistake. So that's another point I often say to people, if you're not going to do it well, don't do it at all. Because if you step in mud, it, that's a lot harder to step out of. And then finally, you know, they do consider what you're doing when deciding where to shop in the first place. I had one of those moments this weekend where I was up in Seattle and, you know, the stereotypically uh, socially friendly brand companies have lines out the door and the others right next door selling the same products don't. So it's kind of lived in real time. From an employee perspective, it's equally important. This is often why a lot of my tech companies come to us. So like, how the hell do I attract and retain my talent? Um, this is one of the only differentiators I have. Let's be honest, a lot of the salaries are not all that different. A lot of the benefits are not all that different. But knowing that this is in the DNA of a company is how I'm getting some of my best talent these days. So similar set of metrics. And then again, this is getting a little more to the punishment point. It's not optional anymore. Customers will find someone else. They do have other options. And by the way, I think the same goes for investors. There is someone else in most spaces offering something, and this is often the differentiator these days. So then I just thought I would throw up a range of very different kind of companies in terms of their life stage that we have worked with, because I think it illustrates um, just again, the range of how and when and where you can implement cause activities. So if you think there's not a corollary for you, there probably is. So Clinique, not to stereotype, but I'm guessing for the females in the room, this might be where you bought you know, your first fancy makeup outside of a drugstore when you were in high school or college or whatever. And most of us still think of Clinique this way. However, where Clinique's really interesting is they're the number one brand in about 70 countries around the world. And so the image of them as a organization and their product is very different. Sometimes it's, you know, in a lot of their Asian markets, they're regarded as being a lot more scientific and precise. In other areas, they're still the teen brand. In yet others, they are the luxury brand. So they kind of came to us and said, look, we've always had a traditional foundation. We're from a very, you know, traditional managing family um, and philanthropic manage, philanthropically minded managing family. But 
we need to use this as a differentiator. In a, in a world where most young people are going to Sephora and much sexier um, purchasing points, and our traditional area of strength was department stores and no one's going in those anymore, what do we do? So we help them put together a really reflective of what's going on in the world modern campaign that hit different consumers at different life points. So for their younger consumers, we were talking about getting your first job. They did a lot of their give back and their product gives to women coming out of high school, coming out of college, applying for first jobs. We did a lot of women coming out of prison and other disadvantaged backgrounds getting ready for work type of give backs. And it was some of the highest responses they've gotten in 20 years as a company that has spent kajillions of dollars on traditional and non-traditional advertising. Um, again, and then we did similar campaigns against empty nest markets and women who are going through other kinds of life moments and trying to connect to folks for whom how you feel about yourself can make a difference. And this was 90% product activations, um, brick and mortar use. It was not actually a big spend, although they did end up putting some spend against one of the areas in which they were always known, and I think it's interesting for younger companies without big pocketbooks, they were known in the cosmetic space for not using celebrities, which is sort of unusual in their space. What they did is went into a lot of the younger influencers, a lot of the YouTube celebrities, the not, I mean, the gals who are talking more about covering up acne than looking glamorous, and what they did is made donations to those influencers on their behalf to whatever organization they cared about, and again, that ROI, um, was exponentially higher than much bigger gifts they had given to really traditional nonprofit efforts. Gucci is just another example that I like to throw out because it's a little unconventional in the sense that, you know, their business image is very high end and very moneyed and frankly not very philanthropic in certain ways. They came to us a number of years ago. They're a very female led company. They actually have a very high resonance among female business leaders and people who do care about cause. And so we helped them put together a really comprehensive strategy that involved both domestic and international projects for women in verticals of health, education, and justice. And the reason that mattered for them is again, there was something for everyone. And then over the years, we have helped them partner with the investor community to the nonprofit community to make sure this is authentic and resonating in their markets. So, and then one other thing I should mention for aspirational consumers, because that's who they were, I think in a way most interested to on the for-profit side, because like so many aging companies, they're trying to figure out how to resonate with a more entry-level consumer. This was the biggest bang for their buck they got there. They got the most online traffic, the most store traffic, and the most purchases at their entry-level products than they had got from any other attempts to engage those markets. TaskRapid, again, kind of running the gamut, is a company who had come to us and said, you know, again, not a lot of budget, but this is deep in our ethos as a company. We want to be socially responsible in everything we do, and we, this is one where really our employees and our customers, this is going to be a differentiator for us. So we did a deep dive with them on the ethos of the company and just ended up saying, look, if you look at what your customers care about, both today and in the future, because they have big expansion plans, they like TaskRabbit as much as doing the actual clinical job that it does because of the connections it makes in communities. Um, that's their biggest feedback, is connecting me to people who then I use again, who I didn't know otherwise. Um, it gets me out of my bubble. And so the vision we've designed with TaskRabbit is fast forward, and it's going to take a few years to get there, and literally they launched their pilot a week ago. Eventually you should be able to connect to improving your community through TaskRabbit in the same way you're going to connect to getting someone to hang your TV on your wall. If you're looking for a volunteer opportunity, if you're a customer, if you're a tasker and you've got a few hours tomorrow and you're looking to give back. Um, also they have a very strong environmental underlay because they were uh, purchased by IKEA last year and that's their area of cause. So they're doing things like adding to every task rabbit, every time a tasker, which is what they're called, comes to a customer's home, they will take for you your goodwill drop off, your whatever, just to try and lighten the footprint of people running around a city. So we're just looking at if we're this you know, connective tissue network in a company, how do we also exploit that for good, not just for the transactions for which the, the company exists. And that is it.